Assalamu alaikum. This podcast has been brought to you by Seekers Guidance, the global Islamic seminary. Help us spread the light of prophetic guidance to millions around the world by becoming a monthly supporter. Make a small donation at seekersguidance.org slash donate. As little as $10 a month can help people find life-changing guidance. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Allahumma salli wa sallam ala Sayyidina Muhammad. النبي الأمي المبعوث رحمة العالمين شفيع المذنبين وقائد الغر المحاجمين وعلى آله وصحابه أجمعين وبعد So uh, I'm going to go over some of the verses or at least one verse dealing with book or chapter 26 of the Ahya which we kind of went over very briefly in the last session ذم الدنيا or the condemnation of the dunya. And it's interesting, if you read the introduction in this chapter by Imam Ghazali, it's the only chapter that I'm aware of where he says, we're not going, because his, his particular methodology is to start off the chapter with all of the relevant Quranic verses. Then he brings the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Then he'll bring what we call akhbar, which are kind of other reports, not necessarily from the Prophet Sallallahu or the Sahaba, but people, awliya, righteous people lived after them. And then he goes into the subject. He said, here, there are too many verses to mention for me to actually talk about the ayat, because it's as if the Qur'an itself, one of its major themes is to condemn the dunya. Uh, and then he goes into the different hadith and reports. And he actually spends quite a bit of time on some of the parables of the dunya. What does that mean? You know, oftentimes we're given like a, a metaphor or a parable or allegory, I think is a better word, to demonstrate to us and put it in more tangible terms what this dunya is, what it represents. So in the, in the literature, it's often represented as uh, al-hajuz, right? Like um, the old woman. Right, which maybe she appears from the outside to be young and attractive and something that one would be interested in, but then when they get closer, then they find out that that's not what it is at all. And that's kind of the parable of the dunya. It's really a mirage. You find the dunya described in the Qur'an as uh, al ghurur for example, often. al ghurur means it is just the base fulfillment of a delusion. Right? And a delusion means you think it's something, but it's actually not that. Right? Um, and that's what's meant by dunya. Because you might say, well, if the dunya is so awful and it's so bad, then how come we're in it? Why are we here then? So we can be miserable? No, it's not to be miserable. It's not so that you have a, a life filled with dejection and sadness and misery and you know, always saying, woe is me and how awful is this place that I'm in and why can't Allah just take me now and that type of thing? No, that's not actually the, the attitude of the believer. But when we say dunya, it's talking about something quite specific. And really it's something that's more a matter of the heart than it is of the outward. Right. So for example, Surah Ali Imran, one of the verses, زُيِّنَ لِلنَّاسِ حُبُّ الشَّهَوَاتِ من النساء والبنين والقناطير المقنطرة من الذهب والفضة والخيل المساومة والأنعام والحرف ذلك متاع الحياة الدنيا It has been made beloved to the people the love right, of shahawat Love is, a, is an attribute of the heart It's not an attribute of anything else It's something that's squarely located within the heart So then it goes on to say, what are these appetites and desires that have been made beloved, right? From uh, uh, gold and silver and wealth and women and, and running springs and all these things and khayl and so forth, horses and stallions, things that people would take pride in the dunya. Right? This is the taking of pleasure, right, of the life of the dunya. وَاللَّهُ عِنْدَهُ حُسْنُ الثَّوَابِ But Allah lies with him the best of rewards. So it's not then that we should condemn our existence within the dunya. That's not the point. But the point is 
what is my relationship to the dunya that I am in, but I am not of. نحن في الدنيا ورسنا تابع للدنيا. Right? We are in it, yes. But that's not who we are. Right? Who we really are, our existence, our true existence, preceded our existence in the dunya. The day of alastu barabbikum. The day that Allah said collectively to all of humanity and all who are ever going to live, am I not your Lord? And we collectively said, bala, shahidna. Yes, we have witnessed this. You indeed are our Lord. So that acknowledgement resides within each one of us. Right? And when we say, for example, and al musibah, when there's a calamity, inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'oon. It's a reminder, right? Because musibah means shock, sadma. means something happened, you know, that overwhelmed you. There was a, a, a reminder. So loss of life, loss of property, loss of something, right? This is the musibah. So why do we then say, inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'un? Why do we say, we are for Allah and to Allah we are returning? Right? And that's what it means. It doesn't say we are going to return. This is ism fa'al. Right? Ism fa'al means it's already happening. You are that. It's an attribute. Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'un. We are returning. So the returning part is intrinsic within each one of us. The minute you were born, you're returning to Allah. The minute you were born, you started dying. إِنَّكَ مَيِّتُونَ إِنَّهُمْ مَيِّتُونَ Speaking to the Prophet in the Quran, you are dying and they are dying. Because dying means, it doesn't mean dead, it means dying. It means you're in the process, you're going there. So the minute that we were born, we're all already, you know, X minus 1. Every minute that passes by, that's closer to the mi'ad, that's closer to your ajal. لِكُلِّ أَجَلٍ kitab, Right? For every time there is a prescribed time, it's going to happen. For every lifespan, it's prescribed. It's going to happen. So as we go along in life, Allah sends us reminders, إِنَّا لِلَّهِ وَإِنَّا إِلَيْهِ رَاجِعُونَ We are for Allah. That's who we truly are for. Not for this. And we are returning to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? And Allah draws so many parables for us, not just in the Qur'an. What the Qur'an does, it points to us where to look oftentimes. So one of the verses that I want to, I want to go over with you from Surah Al-Hadid, where Allah SWT says in verse 20, أَعْلَمُوا أَنَّمَا الْحَيَاةُ الدُّنْيَا لَعِوٌ وَلَهْوٌ وَزِينَةٌ وَتَفَاخُرٌ بَيْنَكُمْ وَتَكَاثُرٌ فِي الْأَمْوَالِ وَالْأَوْلَادِ كَمَثَلِ ضَيْثٍ أَعْجَبَ الْكُفَّارَ نَبَاتُهُ ثُمَّ يَهِيجُ فَتَرَاهُ مُصْفَرًا ثُمَّ يَكُونُ حُطَامًا وَفِي الْآخِرَةِ عَذَابٌ شَيْدِيدٌ وَمَغْفِرَةٌ مِّنَ اللَّهِ وَرِدْوَانٌ وَمَا الْحَيَاةُ الدُّنْيَا إِلَّا مَتَاعُ الْغُرُورِ أَعْلَمُوا أَنَّمَا الْحَيَاةُ الدُّنْيَا لَعِبٌ وَلَهُ No. That's the, one of the most important words in this verse. أَعْلَمُوا Know that the life of the dunya لَعِبٌ وَلَهُ It's just play and frivolity. How do we know that? Right? There's this kind of strange thing when people talk about faith, when they say, accept it on faith, you know, just take it on faith. Like, it's as if you're making a leap of faith. Take a jump and hope that whatever you have faith in turns out to be true. That's not really the Islamic paradigm. Because the Quran tells us, Allah tells us, أَعْلَمُ أَنَّهُ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا اللَّهِ أَعْلَمُ أَنَّهُ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا اللَّهِ No, لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا اللَّهِ no, the dunya is this. So it's knowledge, right? It means it's yaqeen. You should have a certainty about it. Not it's a leap of faith. Well, I hope it turns out like everything the Quran said at the end. No, you have to know it before you get there, right? Know this thing. Why should I know it? Because you heard it from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? Who brought it via a sadiq al masduq, who brought it via our Prophet, وسلم, the one who is sadiq, the one who is truthful, and the one who is trusted. And he is the one who is informing us of this. So, a'lamu, know, right? Know al hayat al dunya la'ibun walahu. How so? Here are al ma'tufat, the things that come after it, explicate that. In what way is it la'ibun walahu? In what, in what forms? Wazina, right? 
So it's an acknowledgement, there's zina, there's an adornment, there's something beautiful about it, there's something enticing about it, which is similar to the verse in Ali Imran. Zuyina linnas, it's the same word from zina, right? Zuyina, it has been made uh, adorned, it has been made beautiful, the love of shahawat. So the dunya is zina, right? There's something attractive about it. It is attractive. So that's an acknowledgement there, but that's where it stops. Right? Zinatun, وَتَفَاخُرٌ بَيْنَكُمْ وَتَكَاثُرٌ فِي الْأَمْوَالِ وَالْأَوْلَادِ تَفَاخُرْ بَيْنَكُمْ So this zina, these adorning things, these beautiful things, everybody wants to have some possession of it. And that's our human nature. We say something beautiful, we want it for ourselves. We want to have something of it for ourselves. Right? When you see like a, a nice sunset or a sunrise and you're outside and you have your phone, what do you do? You take a picture. Why? You want to capture the moment. You want to take it back for yourself, right? You want to record it. Um, if you see something pretty that you want to wear or something that you want to have and hang up in your home, you're like, oh, maybe I'll buy that. I want to possess that thing. So there's this inherent kind of, attra you know, attraction within us to possess those things that are beautiful, right? And that's kind of one of the meanings of love, even romantic love between the opposite sex. It's based upon having a, a possession of the other's love. Not that, that you just show love towards the other, but you also have a desire for that love to be reciprocated, right? That desire for that love to be reciprocated because you want to feel like you possess that. And at the same time, you don't want to share it with anybody else. Right? You don't want the love of that person to be shared, right? their love for you to be shared with others. This is where jealousy comes up, because, you know, I want it. Why, why, why are the other people? Something I want to have to myself. So at the same time that this thing is something about us that will make us lean towards things that are artificially beautiful, we use that same quality within us so that we or reorient it to things that are not just artificially beautiful, but they are meaningfully beautiful, truly beautiful. What are the things that are truly beautiful? Not the zina, not the outward things, but the inward things, right? True love is not just based upon uh, istimala or mule or inclination towards something because it's attractive from the exterior. True love will be based upon something uh, a, a, a wanting of possession and attraction to something for its inner beauty, right? And the inner beauty is going to be the beauty, beauty of quality and not quantity, the beauty of quality, inner attributes. We, we love things that are merciful and compassionate and kind and honest and trustworthy. You know, all of these attributes that all of humankind agrees that they are the best attributes to have, they all found their perfection within the person of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu That's why we love him. And that's why we love those who loved him and those who had something of, took something of that from him. That, that manner, that, that, that character was transmitted to the Sahaba, to the companions, and then that was transmitted to the Tabi'een, the successors, and so forth. And so all of these things being coming from that general source of the Prophet Muhammad the epitome of beauty. So we lean towards that. You know, we, we desire that. So all it is then is to reorient ourselves. Too many people who become, I think, religiously committed, or many people who become religiously committed, they think that, okay, I can't love the dunya, that means I can't love anything. And I have to be harsh with everything. And I have to have sort of this kind of frown, perpetual frown on my face to show that I'm a more religious person and that's what religiosity is about, is to be stern and harsh and rejection of everything. No, I would say it's not quite rejection, it's reorient. You're still a human being, you still have those qualities, you're still going to want to love things, you're still going to want to be attracted to beautiful things, but reorient, reorient it away, away from the dunya and put it towards the akhirah. Right? Things of the akhirah, things that will bring you to akhirah. So here he describes what's this dunya? Tafakhurun baynakum, competition between people, right? I have, uh, you know, uh, 
a Toyota Corolla, oh yeah, well I have a Lexus, oh yeah, well I have a Bugatti, oh yeah, well I have a Lamborghini. This competition back and forth, tafakhur, right? It's all about ego. It's about inflating the ego. وَتَكَاثُرٌ فِي الْأَمْوَالِ وَالْأَوْلَادِ An accumulation of wealth and even of children, right? Not, it's not saying don't have children, but it's saying that if you see your children as a means of um, up, one, you know, up onesmanship you know, of, of other people to say, look, I have more than you. I have more cars. I have a bigger house. I have you know, more wealth. I have this. And people want to do that. People want to feel that way because it inflates their ego. I think there was a survey that was done a few years ago that I remember reading. And people were asked, would you rather... Uh, have double your salary or know that you make or everyone else to have half of what you have? They said, no, I'll have everyone half of what I have. That's a very human trait. You just want to feel better than others. Your situation hasn't changed, but if everyone else's situation goes down, then that's good. That makes me feel okay about myself. This is from amongst you know, the shahawai, from the appetites of the dunya. And then here is the parable. كَمَثَلِ غَيْثٍ أَعْجَبَ الْكُفَّارَ نَبَاتُهُ Right? كَمَثَلِ غَيْثٍ أَعْجَبَ الْكُفَّارَ نَبَاتُهُ Like the rain that comes, أَعْجَبَ الْكُفَّارَ What does the kafir have to do with this? Here, kuffar doesn't mean kafir, it means farmer. Right? Because kufr means to conceal. So the farmer, what does he do? He conceals the seed in the ground. And then he waits for the ghaith, right, for the rains to come and so that he can harvest his crop later in the season or during when it's season. So, كَمَثَلِ غَيْثٍ أَعْجَبَ الْكُفَّارَ نَبَاتُهُ Right? He is so happy with his nabat, with his crops, with his field. ثُمَّ يَهِيجُ Right? But then it goes away because of the seasons. فَتَرَاهُ مُصْفَرًا And it becomes yellow, right, in the winter or in the fall. ثُمَّ يَكُونُ حُطَانًا Then it's nothing. حُطَان Just ash. Nothing is left. That's how the dunya is. You see it on the outside, right? You see it in a particular state that it's in now. But when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says another verse, كُلُّ شَيْءٍ هَالِكٌ إِلَّا وَجْهَ Everything is going away. Everything is destroyed. Right? And it's the same, this is what we call ism fa'al in Arabic, which means that it's not going to be destroyed, it is destroyed. So everything is in a state of going to destruction, going to diminishment, going to non-existence, except for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? And one of the things about the divine view is that there is no sense of Past, present, or future. It's all the same. When you, when you study Tawheed and Aqeedah, when you study the attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we say the attributes are Qadim, that they exist outside of this thing that we call time. And so they are as they are, are, are always going to be as they always were. So if Allah created the dunya, right, and He knows where it's going, then where it's going is its actual state. Even though we don't see that, we're only seeing it from the time frame that we're in. But the moon, the stars, the earth, all that is going away. And Allah has given us signs in the dunya to remind us this. Is not the change of seasons a reminder of that? Isn't the idea, the very idea that we age, right? We get white hairs, our skin becomes less pliable and more wrinkly. We don't get up as fast as we used to. We lose muscle mass, so forth, as we age. What, why? Why is that? Couldn't it have been that we just remain in the same physical state and then, you know, 80 years later, 90 years later, we just go away and die? Why is it that there is a process where things diminish, right? And they become less until they're gone. Look at the, even the moon. The Sahab asked about the moon. Yes, They asked about the hilal. Why is it that in the beginning of the month it's this small crescent silver, new moon, and then it continually gradually gets bigger until it's a quarter moon, and then in the middle of the month it's in its full glory, a full moon, right, and lights up the, day and the night. 
That's why they call them Ayam al Bid or Layad al Bid, the, 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 the white nights, because the moon lights up the 13th, 14th, and 15th of, uh, of the month. But then it gets smaller and smaller and smaller until at the end of the month it's gone. And if you didn't know anybody, you think, well, there doesn't exist a moon because I can't see it. Right? That's how we are. Everything has kind of a beginning and it gets to a dharwa. It gets to a high point, and then it begins to diminish until it's gone. But then it can come back. It's recycled. That's why the Quran also blames the kufar. They say, how is it we're going to be bones and ash and so forth? Then Allah is going to rejoin us once again. Do you not see that all of the parables in the dunya, how is it that you know, uh, uh, the greenery and the crops and so forth, How is it that the greenery and the, and the crops and so forth go away right, in winter and become brittle and yellow and gone as if there was nothing there? And if you never saw the seasons and you looked at that in the winter, you'd think, how could that come back? There's nothing to it, right? But then March, April comes around, things start growing again and then become full bloom in May and June and they last throughout the summer, July and August. And you wonder... SubhanAllah, how, how's that happening? Right? As if there was no life. The birds come back, they build their nests, you know, the, the eggs hatch, they go around, and all of a sudden, life is there once again. And then the cycle repeats itself. And that's the cycle of the dunya, of the life. Right? So, dunya here, what is meant is those things that get in the way of your akhirah. So, you, a, dunya, a dunya is like uh, provision. Take what you need and leave the rest. Yes, you have to eat. Yes, you have to drink. Yes, you have to live in a house. Yes, you have to cover yourself with clothing. These are all necessities. But the idea then is to use them and take part of them in as much as it's going to be a matiya or a mount, right? like a riding animal that takes you towards your akhirah. Anything more than that is distraction, really. Anything more than that is going to be a distraction. So it's like we're all on a journey, right? And we're going through the airport and some people are like, you know, building houses in the airport and trying to, uh, you know, buy new carpet and things. And we're like, we're in the airport, we're leaving. You know, we don't waste your time. Let's just go to the food court, get what we need, and wait for our, get on the flight because we're going to go to the place we're supposed to go. But many of us, we think that the dunya is here and it's the be all and end all. When in the end of the day, it's just passing through. The dunya, dharma marwa, they said dharma karwa, as they say, it's passing through. And it's not the final stage. So um, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to, uh, to avail us of his mercy and of his maghfirah. And in these last ten nights of emancipation, release from the hellfire. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us of those that this month does not end, this night does not end in particular, except we are written amongst those who have been freed from the hellfire and freed from our lower passions and desires. And that we may come out of this Ramadan in a state better than the state that we entered into it and that we be a people of of dhikr and rahmah and compassion and uh, qiyam and siyam uh, and may he make it solely for his sake because he is the one who is capable of doing that alhamdulillah thank you for listening this podcast was brought to you by seekers guidance the global islamic seminary Visit SeekersGuidance.org to access reliable Islamic knowledge taught by qualified teachers. We offer a wide range of courses, podcasts, articles, and a world-class answer service. Support us in spreading free, reliable Islamic knowledge to millions around the world by becoming a monthly supporter. Visit SeekersGuidance.org slash donate and make a small monthly commitment today. Our beloved Prophet, peace and blessings be upon him, said, Whoever guides someone to goodness will have a similar reward. So don't forget to share this podcast and spread prophetic guidance.